Thank you.
Please stand. I am the resurrection and I am the life, said the Lord. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. I, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember not the sins of my youth, but according to your mercy think on me, O Lord. We brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Eye has not seen, nor ear had, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so it will be for those who died as Christians. God will bring them to life with Jesus. Thus we shall be with the Lord. Comfort one another with his words. Almighty God, neither death nor life can separate us from your love. With the whole company of the redeemed in heaven and earth, we praise and magnify your glorious name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever. Amen. We remain standing for our intro at him.
meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Today we come together to remember before God our brother Malcolm Grant, to give thanks to God for his life and to comfort one another in our grief. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for the unity of all people on earth in the words our Savior taught us and in the language of our hearts. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you because you made us in your image and gave us gifts in body, mind, and spirit. We thank you now for Malcolm and what he meant for, to each of us. As we honor his memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Meet us in our sadness and fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving for the sake of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, our Father, your Son, Jesus, died and rose again for our salvation. We entrust to you the soul of your servant, Malcolm Grant, praying that he and all the departed may be revealed as your children when Christ shall come again, to whom... With you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to call upon the following folk to please come forward to render their eulogies um, and please use the lectern on my left hand side, um, Erin, and then Malcolm will come afterwards. Good morning. It is heartwarming to us as Malcolm's family to have such a significant Ring of people here in person and virtually to celebrate his well-lived life. We have been so blessed over the past week by the outpouring of comfort and the tributes expressed in respect of the contribution he made on earth. We are so deeply grateful. My name is Erin Ferguson Ormond and I am Malcolm's daughter. I mention my full name because the choice to retain the name Ferguson as part of my married name was an early ad adulthood reflection of the legacy my dad instilled in us regarding our Scottish heritage as a Ferguson and a strong desire to recognize the principled upbringing that he had shaped. Dad was born in Peter Maritzburg in January 1952, the firstborn of much anticipated twins. Raised by my grandmother a nurse and my grandfather a police detective, he developed a strong sense of principles early, often quoting his father who was also known as Fergie. Because of my grandmother's profession, which was truly her calling, and his own early health struggles, he also developed a strong and ever enduring sense of empathy for those in need, as well as a solid advocacy for the underdog. Once he graduated from the University of Natal with both a BA Law and an LLB, he entered the cadet course for the South African Foreign Service and never looked back. He had found his own calling serving his country and excelled as both a civil servant and as a diplomat during his postings to Israel and the United States, returning later as the ambassador to Israel and finally as ambassador to Mexico and a number of South American countries. Following Dad's retirement, which he would hear none of, he found his final and enduring calling in the agricultural sector, 
driving the establishment of inclusive partnerships across the sector to ensure its ongoing viability and sustainability. As you can tell, Dad took his work very seriously, but the business of being Dad was the most important role he had. Dad was a creature of habit, most notably his morning routine of wheat bix for breakfast every day, except on Saturday, and putting his socks on before his pants, when he wore pants, that is. As some of you'll know, he was a devoted member of the Ferguson clan and therefore wearing his kilt was part of his conviction. His routine and structure were notable, and I remember him saying on many occasions, quoting his own father, messy bed, messy head, and haste makes waste. <laughs> as gentle reminders to Stuart and I, as we developed our individuality, to also establish personal rhythms that would provide security to us in times of crisis. And the crises were many. And this is what I distinctly remember Dad for, his support and counsel, not only to family in times of distress, but to all his friends, colleagues, and the entire community. Everyone sought Dad's counsel and support. And even when not sought, but much needed, Dad ensured he was there for others to provide logic, strength, structure, and most importantly, hope. His humor and perspective, his compassion for others, his astute intellect, and the talents he nurtured in his career in, di of diplo in diplomacy, of skilled negotiation and building trusted relationships, were channeled by him into building a network of community that buoyed itself in times of need. But I also distinctly remember Dad as supporting specific individuals. He believed that society should be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable, he tried to help all those he could in big and small ways, from students requiring financial assistance at university, startup businesses requiring mentorship and financial assistance, travelers passing through, and the homeless. Dad never turned anyone away. Family meals that he prepared with my mom on the weekend were part of our religion, and he took the practice of frying bacon and eggs and brying steak and forth, vorse, with his daddy chips very seriously. Some of my earliest memories are the aroma of fried breakfast on Saturday mornings and the sound of him playing his piano on Sunday mornings. Dad sang in a number of church choirs across the world and along with his affinity for music, he loved history and the arts and deeply instilled the same passion in Stuart and I by insisting that during high school, high school along with the necessary hard subjects of mathematics and science, we both develop our talents in music and art respectively, and our talents as individuals. As teenagers, Stuart and I both tested the ends of his tolerance for our talents. Stu in a band with his late nights and long hair of rebellion, and me with my pricey horse obsession. But his support was endless and unwavering. But it was not all serious business. Dad had an easy and contagious sense of humor, and he enjoyed relaxing both in his leather lazy boy at home and in the quiet beauty of his garden and nature, watching and listening to the birds. It was in marrying Sue that he finally started to slowly drink in the subtle beauty of being alive and would relish in sharing pictures of the many trips he took with her into the countryside during the course of his work, which he would also use for much needed rest and relaxation. As children, we had many outings to historical sites in and around Pretoria, attended the Scottish music festivals, and hiked frequently with our dogs. He loved his many dogs, and it was not uncommon for us to have seven dogs at a time, as he could never say no to a stray that needed a home. He walked his dogs most evenings and sent me many pictures of the sunsets he had taken during these walks. He adored his three grandchildren. Like Stuart, Emil, and I, he repeatedly told them how beautiful and cherished they were and how proud he was of them. He relished the art of cooking and entertaining, bringing magnificent Christmas meals and pre-mixed margaritas to our house to give us time off from the kids and to enjoy relaxing during the festive season too. He was selfless. Dad, I will forever be grateful to you for being resolutely and unapologetically you, and for imparting the desire to learn, to explore, to be curious about every subject, and to hear and empathize with the story of every human being. And to reiterate to us that every living being was loved by God and therefore deserved our love, compassion, and patience in return. 
Having you as my father was a privilege and a gift. Your resilience, limitless work ethic, and your overwhelming duty to our family, others, and to this country has been and will always be my inspiration. Rest peacefully, Dad, and be proud of a life well lived and what will be your enduring legacy. Hello, everyone. My name is Stuart Ferguson. I'm Malcolm's son. To tell you I'm devastated is not true. I'm far beyond that. I was notified of my father's passing when I finished work in Toronto last Friday. And I'm grateful to my sister that she said, you have to sit down to hear this. I could talk to you about my father for hours. But nobody likes a long speech. And I don't think I can talk my sisters. Well done, Beanie. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you some insight into who my father was. And growing up, some of my first memories of my father, and I saw in, in the slides earlier that one of them's there, is we had a double carriage that my pram that my sister and I used to be pushed around in. And I remember my father pushing me in that. I recall my father constructing a swing set for us. And uh, he used several select four-letter words, which are not good for church. But he managed to do it. He made sure it happened. I remember one of my favorite places when we were in Washington, D.C. was my sandbox. He built it for me. He bought a tarp. He bought wood. He constructed it. He put sand into it. Not a complicated operation. And it was executed perfectly for my three-year-old mind. But the amount of joy it gave me I cannot explain. He told me I must take my trucks and my digger and put sand in the, the truck, in the dump truck, and move it to the other side of the sandbox and dump it off and use the crane to move it and repeat and just keep doing that until you run out of sand. And when you run out of sand, you go back the other way. You know, it seems inexplicable, like why you would do this. But as a child, it's entertaining, but it also teaches you work. It teaches you a work ethic, that life cannot just be chaos. My father was one of the most ordered men I've ever come across. Except maybe sometimes his home office, which is a bit cluttered. But he knew where things were. He knew which pile to look in. He knew who to call when he needed something. He had so many contacts. He knew so many people that he touched so deeply. And the, the, the turnout here at the church today is just incredible. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And I can honestly say my family and myself, we are grateful that all of you came. I recognize many of the faces here. Some of them I don't. Some of them know who I am. I've just forgotten who you are. Because my, fa my father's, from when he started to when he finished, he influenced, as my sister said, so many people. I will tell you another lesson my father taught me is that he said, always do your best. Always, in everything you do, you do your best. And sometimes your best isn't good enough. So that's when you practice and you learn. And you learn more until you can do what you need to do. You never give up. Fail, you do not fail if you fail. You only fail if you don't try again. And that was his attitude to everything in life. Uh, my sister shared a wonderful idiosyncrasy about my father, about putting his socks on first. There is logic to this. I can explain it to you, but I'm not going to. I will tell you, however, about one of the incredible things my father used to do specifically with me. So, and I'll give you an example. He didn't like to use the nouns and verbs, etc., that were appropriate for the situation. He would just substitute it with a thing. We were putting together a table, and he asked me for the thing, for the things, to put into the thing. Okay, so I'm helping him, and you know, I'm maybe 11 years old, and then I said, what thing? And he said, the thing. And then, you know, I said, please, I need you to tell me. He's like, oh, I need the hammer for the nails to put into the table. 
It just, and he used to do this quite often. And I'll share just a couple more memories, and then I'll, 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 I'll wrap up, is my father loved rugby. My father loved rugby. His opinion, if you loved anything more than rugby, there was something wrong with you. And he used to, all the time, and I'm very happy to see him, uh, Wombas, he used to drag us out as kids to go and watch rugby, whether we liked it or not. And I'm so grateful for it because to this day I love rugby. I absolutely love rugby. I spoke to my father consistently since I've been in Canada, a few times a week at least, at minimum, because he was my friend and he was my consul and he guided me. But he, in our conversations, we used to find the most random things. And that is the final lesson that I'm gonna share that he taught me is to never have a closed mind. Always learn. You can always learn more and things are interesting. Life is only boring if you close your mind to it. The last conversation I had on the phone with my father was a discussion about the benefits of a trolley pole versus a pantograph. If you know what those things are, that's great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. But these are the things we used to discuss. I would learn and I would often learn things with him and he would teach me. And Pops, you were a wonderful father and I find solace in knowing that you're sitting with the Lord right now looking down on us. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you. Thank you for sharing with us, um, Malcolm, um, sorry, Stuart and uh, Aaron about Malcolm, and I hope your dad was a Blue Bulls fan, because <laughs> I'm one. I'm going to call on the colleagues and friends of uh, Dr. Malcolm to come forward to also um, share with us what God has placed on their hearts. Dr. Rolf Mayer and the Ian Lawrence. Good morning, my name is Rolf Meyer, and I appreciate the fact that the family has asked me also to make a contribution. After the beautiful words of the children, I feel like I should not say anything. But uh, Malcolm was close to some of us, particularly during the last few years. And uh, it, I believe it's in that regard that I was asked to, to come forward. When I look at this picture of him, which I believe was only taken a week ago, I think it symbolizes what we have experienced of Malcolm during the last few years. I came to know him when he was in the office of Bogbota, and I'm not quite sure who was the tallest of the two of them. Uh, but he was uh, already by then an impressive young servant of the Department of Foreign Affairs, as it was then. I thereafter came uh, across him on uh, overseas visits and during the services that, that he uh, offered in various countries for South Africa. Uh, but I lost contact over a period of time. And then uh, after my own retirement, and, and obviously his retirement, we came together uh, almost incidentally here in Pretoria. When uh, I noticed that he was involved and started to take interest in what became known as the Agricultural Development Agency. Uh, it was during that period that we started to work together very closely. And also with many of you who are here present this morning. So my words would go to him especially to thank him 
and appreciate the role that he has played in that regard. Uh, in my last comment that I wrote to, for him last Friday evening, uh, after hearing the passing, tragic passing of, of, of Malcolm, I said that I can't believe the many friends and, and fans that he has created in such a sp short space of time. I think it was only six years since we started with this whole project, and which led to the establishing of the Agricultural Development Agency, of, he, of which he was not only a, a founding member, but the real founder. And together with Leona Archery, who is the CEO and present here this morning of this agency, they have done amazing work in a short space of time. And I think if there's one thing that Malcolm would absolutely enjoy us celebrating as part of his last years was the fact that he contributed in this way. He left us far too soon. He was 71, yes, that's true. But that's early in life nowadays. Some of us are even older than that already. But he left us far too soon. And I think the only explanation, and I've said it to myself many times during this past week, it could have been any one of us, most certainly. But I believe that the fact that it was he who was chosen is probably an indication that he was ready to go if life, his life was fulfilled. His dreams, to that extent, was fulfilled. Many things could have been said about Malcolm. There are a lot of tributes in this little pamphlet that Leona and team have prepared, but there's one that I would like to add in terms of my personal experience of him during his time as a servant of the nation on the broader scale in the international community, but particularly also during the last few years, and that is that he was a true patriot to the family. That is how I think many of us would remember him, a true patriot. And the example that he had set for so many people, colleagues, friends, fans around the country and I would believe around the world, we should all live up to that on an ongoing basis. Thank you to the family, and I convey our condolences as people who were working with him very closely, as members of the Agricultural Development Agency, I convey our condolences to you. I wish you well. Thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> My name is Ian Lawrence. I don't have the endurance to get to the end, so I've asked Greg Mills, a friend, to assist me in the end. I didn't know Malcolm all my life. I think about 10 years. It was by coincidence that I met him. Um, I was putting a business venture together in Mozambique, and I approached an uh, affluent friend and asked him if he would like to invest with me. And he looked at me and he said, no, but I think you need an angel and I will send an angel to help you. That was Malcolm. So, uh, Malcolm became part of my life and every day was worth a year. But the days were too few. I can keep you busy all day with his virtues. I don't intend to. His honesty of opinion was something that was extraordinary. I uh, made a, a habit of inviting about 25 friends every year to the Bushveld 
where we just as men we sit around the fire and talk and discuss issues and share opinions and the wisdom that he had absolutely flabbergasted the people so much so that when we heard this we couldn't believe it and they asked me to please put together something that uh, resembled this time together and the memory that uh, that um, we had and I'm going to ask Greg to read it thank you very much so I'm the uh, version of the bomb squad uh, coming off the bench uh, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, he says, Tonight the sun will set in Africa. The guinea fowl will return to congregate under their sleep tree. After a short heated argument, each one will fly into the roost and settle for the night. An uneasy silence holds, but only for a short while. Until a yakal howls, checking on his mate, she calls back, confirming her position. Silence. Then a mighty roar booms from the resident pride male. His roar rumbles on over the plains of Africa. He is calling Malcolm to his eternal home. Rest satisfied for all you have accomplished, my special, gentle friend, Malcolm Ferguson. Remember, men like you never die. You are carved in our memories forever. And us? When we stare into the fire under the Southern Cross, telling stories of good men, we will whisper your name. Then we will plant a tree for you to mark one of the many paths you walked and the trails you left behind in this world. We celebrate the life of a unique man that made the world a better place. Until we meet again in the afterlife, your friend, Ian. Because I'm an academic and we can never resist uh, a podium, with uh, the family's permission, may I just say a few words about Malcolm from beh the, on behalf of that community, as it were. And to Sue, Stuart, Erin, uh, Lorna and family and Malcolm's many friends that are gathered here today, uh, I just have the following brief recollections to add to what has been said before. Now, Malcolm was one of the first old DFA, and there are many of you represented here today, officials I met, and that was in the bathroom of the South African Institute of International Affairs. You don't have to read anything into that. On returning to South Africa in 1990, and we remained firm friends ever, sent, ever since. He was a man of studiously wise counsel, which is what we have heard repeated here over and over today. Despite the age gap of more than a decade, he sort of adopted me as a rather errant academic child uh, in his world uh, in his, with his extraordinary insights in, into diplomacy. And as a consequence, we shared many adventures together in Venezuela, in Nigeria, which I'll come back to in a second, in El Salvador, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and all over the many agricultural spots of South Africa, as we've heard. Together we wrote, we attended conferences, we conducted field work, and we laughed a great deal, often at our own expense. And that was one of his endearing traits, his ability to self-deprecate, which always for me is the mark of a true person. One story immediately comes to mind in this regard. Shortly after his retirement from Durko, and Malcolm always had a wonderful way of describing his retirement, he said he fired his employers, uh, which is something I'm going to borrow. Um, we were together responsible, and this is where he was really out there in terms of his thinking, uh, to take the chief of the Colombian army to Nigeria to teach the leadership of the Nigerian army about countering insurgency in the face of the threat of Boko Haram, 
We thought that such a person would be far more acceptable than the usual throng of Europeans and Brits that always went to provide advice. And so, of course, it was Malcolm's idea, it proved. But the foyer of the Abuja Hilton Hotel is a notorious gathering spot for the local night riders, or ladies uh, of the night, uh, and some men, I'm informed. Um, and having been propositioned far too many times during this week in Nigeria, I must have had that air of desperation about me. I gave them Malcolm's room number on leaving and told them to come up later in the night, which, of course, they were hugely delighted about. This was not a very nice thing to do, but was powerful the course that Malcolm and I uh, always ran. And he never said anything about it. And I know they definitely would have gone to that room. He was in a more serious vein, always someone whose insights I sought out, his depth and breadth of knowledge as impressive as his honesty was searing and invaluable in the world, sorry, Rolf, of politics. He had a lovely expression, your eyes never lie. It was something that his father had taught him, and it was something that my father, coincidentally, had taught me. And this was about taking in the environment that you were immersed in, and learning, and watching, and listening, and learning from other people around you. And that's a quality that not many people have, this ability to hear other people's stories. And that Malcolm was absolutely excellent at. He always made time to listen to what people are best at, which is telling you about themselves. We came from the same planet, so to speak, and had the same destination in mind, as we all do, for our country, South Africa. We will all miss him in my community a great deal. Thank you. to ask Lorna to come and say a few words, Malcolm's twin sister. I, as Sue said, I'm Lorna, Malcolm's twin. I was greatly privileged to have as my twin a brother who's larger than life. He came into the world and drew breath, <coughs> and drew breath 10 minutes before I did. And now I have to work out how I'm going to continue without him. Because a twin relationship is completely unique. If there are any twins in the audience, I think you'll understand that as well. You never feel alone. And it didn't matter how many or what hemispheres divided us, the north and the south or the east and the west, we always spoke on the telephone. Even now, we used to speak mainly when he and I were walking our dogs. We spoke mainly about politics and law. What Aaron didn't mention was that Malcolm passed his law degree cum laude. And he was my greatest support when I became an attorney when I was 54 years old. He was driving me to an arbitration about seven years ago in Ermelo, and we had an argument, which we often did, um, about whether the rains had come too late and were affecting the mealy crops. Well, there was only one way to sort it out, and that was to stop the car and go bounding into the farmer's mealy fields on either side and then yell, yell at each other through the leaves, come and look at this one. See, this one, this one proves my point, and this one proves my point. We also spoke a lot about our dogs, and we used to send each other photographs of our dogs all the time. 
not very long ago, about six weeks ago, Malcolm's very aged little fox terrier fell into the swimming pool and nearly died. Anyway, he rescued her. And for the next five days, he gave me a running commentary, probably three or four or five or six or seven times a day on how his little dog was coming to life again until he finally sent me a video of her prancing around the back garden <laughs> and how he'd saved her life. And she really was on her last legs and I think still is. Malcolm and I never called each other by, by our names. He was always brother, and he used to call me Sisty, unless we were having an argument, in which, in, in which case he used to call me Sis. <laughs> I would just like to tell him how much I love him and how hard it's going to be to not have him around. Thank you, brother, for being there always for me. Thank you. I need my support system as well, where is he? Uh, I'm Sue Fortina, um, Malcolm's wife, recently. A lot of people have asked me how I am, and thanks for your concern, and as you can see, I'm fine. Nothing is broken except my heart. People have asked me what happened, so I thought for closure, perhaps, um, I can just talk about that briefly. I believe he had a heart attack and lost consciousness before um, drifting across the road and hitting a parked tanker on the other side. Um, we were on our way to an overnight stop after a very successful farm visit on Agda Business, and he had been really happy that day and very happy with the decisions made. And this picture was taken on that farm visit. So. I met Malcolm late in life. We met online and I knew immediately that he was somebody really special and that we were kindred spirits. We wrote to each other for several weeks and when we finally met in 2016, I was impressed by his air of quiet confidence and his kindness. I was privileged to be married to him for three years and I had hoped that it would be so much longer. Malcolm was not just a good man, he was a great man. You've heard some of the tributes. We received literally hundreds. And he was also a very humble man, and I didn't hear many of the stories until much later. This yellow sash draped over his picture is a knighthood conferred on him by the Mexican government for services rendered to their country. I didn't know this until Malcolm wore it on our wedding day. Despite rubbing shoulders with high-level politicians and leaders, he was very down-to-earth. I just want to thank everyone for being here and everyone online. Um, Malcolm was very loved. A special thank you to the people who traveled to be here, um, Stuart, Ian Lawrence, um, his sister Glenda and, his, and, and, and um, her family. And I'm sorry if there's other people that I don't know about. A big thank you to Erin, who's been the most incredible support and without which this memorial service would not have come together. And Emil, thank you for the photos in the hall. And Lorna, for your good advice, which some of which I followed. <laughs> thank you all for your kind words and your beautiful tributes. I wish we could have heard them all today. Um, we received condolences and tributes from the Oppenheimer family, 
Um, we've heard from AGDA, from the government of Mexico, from the ambassador of Israel to South Africa, from the embassy of South Africa in Mexico, and too many to count from his past colleagues um, and friends. I'm going to compile a book, and by the looks of things, it will be a fairly meaty book, with all the tributes and the photos that we've received. And it will comfort me and the family in the very difficult days that are to come. So if you'd like a copy, please just drop us a line, Erin or myself, and we'll get you a copy as well. Thanks to Agda, and in particular Leona, Rolf, and Iga for all this support in this very difficult time. And something I'm really extremely excited about is that Agda have set up the Agda Malcolm Grant Ferguson Scholarship Fund as a tribute to his legacy. So in lieu of flowers, uh, please consider making a donation to that, to that fund with the details at the back of the pamphlet. And this fund has been established to provide financial assistance to university level students of agricultural economics. And we thought that would be a fitting tribute and legacy and Malcolm's work will live on in that. I think he would have been very pleased. Thank you to all the people who've reached out to us and provided support, prayers, their stories and their tears. And thank you to my son Max for being with me through and for all that he's done that has been invaluable and without which I couldn't have got through this. And also to Charity and Wendy, my father's carers, for just looking after him when I could not. He has Alzheimer's and I could not deal with that at the same time. And thank you to Father Mishak for the beautiful service and his kindness to us. And to all the many angels who were sent to help us at the accident site and subsequently as well. We will all miss Malcolm dearly, and we will never forget him. Thank you, folks. We continue the service with the liturgy of the word. And our scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from the first verse. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. While we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for our, due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Instead of reciting the psalm, we will stand and sing the psalm together, Psalm 23. Please stand.
standing for the gospel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Listen to the good news proclaiming the gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter, reading from the first verse. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, you don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ. Christ our Lord. Please be seated. The earthly tent that Malcolm Grant Ferguson lived in has been destroyed. That's what St. Paul says in our text. He is talking about his human body. The body, says St. Paul, is an earthly tent. In the Bible, tent calls to mind Israel's wilderness experience. We remember how Israel lived in the wilderness for 40 years. Israel lived in tents. He was not allowed to settle down, establish roots somewhere during that time. She was constantly on the move. Her address was not fixed and her homes were not secured on firm foundations. Here on earth, says the apostle, we live in an earthly tent and like Israel in the wilderness, our roots are not permanent. Our address is not fixed. Our foundations are not firm nor secure. Our life here on earth is but transitory and temporary. None of us are permanent residents of this earth. Like Israel in the wilderness, we are but sojourners, pilgrims, travelers, and wanderers. Malcolm lived long and full life on this earth. He was in his 70s. Yet, my dear friends in the Lord, what is years as measured against history? Or what is 71 years as measured against eternity? One might say, not much at all. You know what the psalmist say in Psalm 103? As for men, his days are like but grass. He, not, he flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. Life, dear friends, in the Lord is so precious. And we all fight to live, metaphorically so. Yet that life is so temporary and transitory. It is not permanent or eternal. There comes a day when the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. The years of growth, the years of increase, last for such a time. So much can happen to our earthly tent. A lot of things may happen to us health-wise. We may suffer a failing or faltering heart. Or life can be taken through a tragic accident as in the case of Malcolm. But my dear friends in the Lord, no matter how that happens, we are assured that by the words of the gospel, these people of God are going home. St. Paul sums this up by saying, while we are in this tent, 
we groan and are burdened. Whatever the case may be, or cause may be, someday the earthly tent we live in will be destroyed and we will return home and be with our Maker, as is the case with Malcolm, whose life we celebrate and give thanks to. The tent image indicates that we are sojourners, we are pilgrims, we are travelers and wanderers while on this earth. This indicates that we are on a journey to another place, a much more better place than where we are. The end of the Christian's journey causes tears to fall on the part of those who are left behind, as is the case now. For they will miss the person whose journey has ended. The end of a Christian journey, however, my dear friends in the Lord, should not lead to despair or inconsolable grief. Sure, the journey has ended, the earthly tent has been destroyed. A loved one has been taken from my sight. But there is reason for hope and joy. There is comfort for those left behind. For we are children of God. St. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, points out comfort for God's children, comfort for the present, and comfort for the future. For the present, there is comfort to be taken. If a Christian ends his or her journey and God is pleased with how life was put. What is this present comfort, one might ask? Holy Scripture tells us that when a believer dies, he or she is at home with the Lord. Home, my dear friends, the Lord. You know what home is. Home is that place where we belong. Home is the place where we find love. Home is the place where we find shelter. Home is the place where we find security, fellowship, and acceptance. Home is where we find our loved ones. Here on this earth, we are not really at home. But when we pass on, we go home. We go to Jesus. One Eric Bakker, a missionary from Great Britain, spent over 50 years in Portugal preaching the gospel, often under adverse conditions. And during World War II, the situation became so critical that he was advised to send his family, his wife and eight children, back to England for safety. His sister and her three children were also evacuated on the same ship. Although his beloved relatives were forced to leave, he remained behind to carry on God's work. On the Lord's day following their departure, Reverend Baker stood before his congregation and said, I've just received word that all my family have arrived safely home. He then proceeded with the service as usual. Later, the full meaning of his words became known to his people. He had been handed a wire just before the service informing him that a submarine had torpedoed the ship and everyone on board had drowned. He knew that because all were believers and they were at home with the Lord. This, my dear friends, in the Lord is not to downplay our present existence. For in the body we are also with the Lord. We do fellowship with the Lord right now. But when we pass on, our fellowship with the Lord is more direct and infinitely better than it is now. The same St. Paul says in Corinthians, the first letter that he writes to the church, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. The Christian who dies goes home to be with the Lord. Think about this, my dear friends in the Lord. For the child of God, death is not the end. It is, a gateway, it is a gateway, a doorway to a better life with Jesus. Death is a homecoming. And all homecomings are joyful, wonderful experiences. Death is the end of a lifetime pilgrimage here on earth. The Christian's journey ends when he or she is at home with the Lord. And the case is true with Malcolm. 
And no wonder the Apostle Paul can tell us in another place that not even death can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Presently, here on earth, my dear friends in the Lord, we are sojourners. We are pilgrims and wanderers. We are travelers. We don't really have a place we can call a permanent home. When we die, we go to a place that is our eternal home. Today we are gathered together because Malcolm Grant Ferguson has gone home. But it is our comfort to know that this is not just any home. He is at home with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No longer is he a sojourner, a pilgrim, a traveler, or a wanderer. No longer is he in a place where all was temporal. And I can say this confidently because when we met with the family and talked about who he was, a thing that stood out above everything else was his authentic relationship with God. And because of this relationship, we are confident to say and we believe that he's now at home with the Lord. And of course, the way he carried himself and lived his life speaks volumes to that. He made it a point, the way he lived his life, that he pleased only his Lord as he saw the image and the likeness of God in others and when going on to serve them as best as he could. And therefore, confidently so I can say his life revolved around Jesus. His life was a living testimony to his faith as one who had the words that Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And going on to hear Jesus say again, go and do likewise. And that's how he lived his life. And so my dear friends in the, in the Lord, we have this confidence. Death is not the end for him. Rather, it is a homecoming. And he knew this. Dying is not bad if you know where you are going. He knew where he was going. He knew he was going home. He knew he was going to be with his Lord. And there is also a future comfort. The Apostle Paul says, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. As I said, my dear friends in the Lord, presently, we are sojourners, travelers, and wanderers here on earth. In the future life, we live in a permanent structure with a secure foundation, a structure that lasts forever, a structure that will never decay or be destroyed. Our earthly tent, though it is a gift from God, is the result of the union between a man and a woman. Our eternal house, on the other hand, is made by Jesus. And you know the words of our Lord. Do not be, or rather do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going ahead of you to prepare a place for you? It is Jesus who is making our eternal house. And his promises hold true. And what is this eternal house not built by human hands? It is our glorious resurrection. We may now live in a tent, but there awaits God's children a permanent building. We may now be sojourners, pilgrims, travelers, and wanderers, but there will come a time when we can put down permanent roots. We may now live in a decaying and aging body, but there awaits us a glorious resurrection body. The body does not grow old. This body does not suffer pain or illness. This body <coughs> has 
has no challenges, mental, physical, whatsoever. This body is perfect in every way imaginable. It is not afflicted with a forgetful memory, poor sight, or clumsy coordination, or a failing and faltering heart. It is a perfect, glorious, wonderful body that will last throughout all eternity, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Revelation 21 assures us of that. The body built by Jesus is the believer's future home. We know that of his faith in Jesus, that Malcolm has claimed this body too. He is clothed with heavenly dwelling. He is no longer a sojourner, a pilgrim, a traveler, and a wanderer. Someday, my dear friends in the Lord, the journey of each one of us will also come to an end. Someday the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Someday, every one of us, like Malcolm, will get home. And my prayer is that those words that Jesus speaks about, and I'm sure that were said at his arrival also, well done and welcome, good and faithful servant. I hope and pray that that will be the same with all of us when we get home. Remember, my dear friends in the Lord, there awaits us a building, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. As Jesus assures us, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If you were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And for that, we give thanks to God that Malcolm has found a room in that home. Malcolm is part of that. We continue to pray for his soul. We continue to pray for his loved ones left on this side of eternity. And we ask God's Holy Spirit to guide them and guard them as they continue to live their lives this side as he would have wished. And to you, loved ones, family and friends, may the Lord bless you and watch over you. May the Lord make his face shine upon me gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for his church, confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus. And so we join our prayer to his We give you thanks and praise, Almighty Father, that you sent your Son to die and raised him from the dead. We praise you in the confidence that you save all your people, living and dead. Lord, hear us. We thank you for Malcolm Grant Ferguson, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life and is now admitted to the company of the saints. Lord, hear us. Eternal God and Father, whose love is stronger than death, we rejoice that the dead as well as the living are in your love and care. And as we remember with thanksgiving, Malcolm, and all those who have gone before us in the way of Christ, we pray that we may be counted worthy to share with them the life of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord Christ, you spoke words of comfort to your friends, Martha and Mary in the hour of sorrow. Give consolation and courage to those who mourn today. And may they find their peace and hope in you, the resurrection and the life. For your tender mercy's sake, Lord, hear us. Lord Christ, you are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from the dead. In you we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. Keep us firm in this faith, setting our hearts on things above, so that when you appear, we too may appear with you in glory. Lord, hear us. 
Grant us, Lord, the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth. Lead us to repent of our sins, both the evil we have done and the good we have not done. And strengthen us to follow in the steps of your Son, in the way that leads to the fullness of eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, hear us. We pray for those who trusted in the Lord and are now in sleep, are now, and now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. Lord, hear us. We pray for all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom. Lord, hear us. Please stand for our next hymn.
gracious God, nothing in death or life, nothing in the world as it is, nothing in the world as it shall be, nothing in all creation can separate us from your love. Jesus commanded his spirit into your hands at his last hour. Into those same hands we now commend this your servant, Malcolm Grant. That having died to this world, cleansed from sin, death may be for him the gate to life and to eternal fellowship with you. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. To God the Father who loved us and made us accepted in the Beloved, to God the Son who loved us and loosed us from our sins by his own blood, to God the Holy Spirit who shared love of God abroad in our hearts, to the one true God be all love and all glory for time and eternity. Amen. Alleluia. Please be seated. Lord God, you entrusted to us, and now you embrace your servant in love. 
take into your arms together with all those who have died. Comfort us, your servants, who seek to do your will and to know your peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Rest eternal, grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace and rise in glory. Thank you very much for joining us for this celebration of the life of Mr. Ferguson. Please do join us in the hall for refreshments and for some time of fellowship with the family. There is one final rendition before we leave the church that bids farewell to Malcolm.